Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first um, BioDT webinar. We'll just wait a couple of minutes for people to get in so that everybody can follow the, the meeting with us. Okay, in the meantime, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Federico Drago from Trust IT Services. I'm the communications manager of this project. And I would like to welcome you to this first webinar of the project in which we will get to know the objectives and the context in which BioDT operates. Um, we will get to know the infrastructure that hosts, that will host the digital twin prototype. And we will have Jesse Harrison uh, from CSC, the BioDT project manager, introducing the first part. And then Alexi Callio, uh, also from CSC, the BioDT Digital Twin Technical Platform Manager, introducing the Lumi Supercomputer Infrastructure. Then we'll just do a brief um, poll on menti.com. And the, the third part will be an, an exciting panel discussion in which we have invited experts from different fields, uh, ranging from the European Open Science Cloud to HPC to the field of biodiversity research, of course. We will then wrap up and uh, so the webinar will be around one hour in total. We invite you to use the Q&A uh, function here on Zoom if you have any questions for our speakers. So in this way, in this way basically, it's easier for us to keep track of what happens uh, in the background. And we would like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded. And uh, both the slides from the first two presentations and the webinar recording will be made available on the BioDT website after the event. So um, as I conclude this brief introduction, I would like to give the floor to my partner uh, here in the project, uh, Jesse Harrison, project manager uh, from CSC. Thanks, Federico. So just one second while I set up here. Okay, hopefully all of you can see my screen here now. Uh, so the purpose of, of my presentation is to very much just introduce you to the BioDT project and discuss the project objectives and also the uh, use cases that we will be approaching as part of this uh, three-year Horizon Europe project. So. Uh, just to look at quickly the contents of the presentation, so I will discuss the concept of digital twins, uh, especially with reference to the BioDT project. And after that, I will go through uh, some of the project goals and uh, anticipated outcomes. And then the remainder of the presentation, I will spend on discussing the actual practical use cases where we hope to make use of the uh, digital twin project. So. Maybe the first question that comes up when we think about BioDT project is, uh, well, what is a digital twin? And we can think of this as a virtual representation of uh, entities and processes that exist in the, in the physical world, so the real world. And the virtual representations are then synchronized at some specified frequency and fidelity, uh, depending on the purpose and context of the, uh, of the digital twin. So to summarize this, we have an object in, in real space, which is the physical twin, and then we have a virtual object, which is the digital twin. <clears throat> and we have data being passed from the real world object to the uh, virtual object. And we might, for example, want to model some specific aspect of nature using uh, the virtual components or model, for example, from which we get information that can be then used and in the context of BT, bio DT, especially in, in uh, ecological research and uh, furthering our understanding of biodiversity dynamics. So the digital twin concept originates from industry and there it is used especially to design products and to, to operate machinery, for example. But 
in the BioDT project, the goal is very much to use this digital twin concept to mimic specific behaviors we might see in nature in terms of, for example, species uh, distributions and space and over time. And to make that possible, we have a number of, of use cases that we will then try and address during the next three years as part of the project. So uh, digital twins will be used to meet requirements of BioDT use cases. And the, the kind of wider perspective of this project is that we have this uh, European Commission goal of devising a, a full digital twin of the Earth. And we can think of the BioDT project as perhaps one, one branch of that initiative. So there are also, also other DT initiatives uh, in Europe, focusing on, for example, climate modeling and, and so forth, but we will focus on the biodiversity component in, in BioDT project. And so in this project, we have three main objectives. So one is to, to of course, build a prototype um, for running the BioDT and deploy it. So that's the first objective. Another one is to, to integrate uh, the BioDT with, with different re research infrastructure platforms and workflows. So we have a number of uh, biodiversity research infrastructures involved in this project as well. So we have in total 22 different partners, but uh, we have also four uh, biodiversity research infrastructures involved, and I will introduce those a little bit later. Uh, the third objective is to ensure that whatever we do in this project will remain compatible with these uh, wider European digital twin projects that are ongoing, including Destination Earth, and making sure that uh, also we comply with uh, European demands on, on making data available, uh, usable and accessible as part of the European data infrastructure. So just to go through some of the specific objectives and outcomes in, in more detail. So we have, first of all, establishing this uh, BioDT prototype. And the idea is to, to establish this on, on Lumi supercomputer, which is a Euro HPC uh, supercomputer for European use. And Alexi will talk more about the Lumi ecosystem after, after my presentation. <clears throat> and as part of establishing the, the platform, we have a different number of case studies for uh, developing models that address some relevant questions in, in biodiversity science. And of course, as part of, of setting all this up, we have to do quite a lot of model development and validation work as well. So we have a total of eight different case studies that we want to, to work with. And very much the model side of things will be developed around these different case studies that we have as part of the project. Mm. <clears throat> the goal or let's say a kind of sub goal is to achieve improved model predictive performance and also better model accuracy and precision. So there's a part of this project that is very much focusing on upscaling the tools for high performance computing as, as well. Uh, the second goal is about integration with research infrastructures. And for this, we need different types of interfaces that will then work in unison with applications that are available through these, um, or let's say existing applications available through these infrastructures. So this will require some work in terms of setting up user authentication and access, making sure that the data we work with, the software we work with and overall practices remain interoperable. And there's also a strong training component to this project. So we want to, of course, reach new user communities, make sure that uh, whatever we do will be also available to the wide, wider research community. So yes, <clears throat> to summarize this, we want to have uh, interfaces for feeding data to the BioDT platform. We want to make sure that we have data sets that adhere to fair principles, so the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable uh, data sets that adhere to, to the same standards across the different research infrastructures we work with. And then this, there is this abbreviation uh, on my slide, which is FDO, so fair digital object. We can think of a fair digital object as, um, well, at the core, you have the actual data set, but then we have all these surrounding aspects that make it adhere to fair principles. So we could have, for example, persistent identifiers and, and so forth 
uh, metadata associated with the actual um, data sets to make it more accessible and easy to use in the future. Um, developing quality indicators, so we want to also assess how well our data sets uh, adhere to the third principles and how accurate they are. And as I mentioned, developing training materials and also uh, setting up workshops. So for example, these hackathons where you could bring your own data. Third objective is to uh, ensure interoperability with these uh, other digital twin initiatives. So one example is Destination Earth. And so we hope to set up these uh, showcases to look at how to synchronize the, the BioDT digital twins that we will develop with, with other digital twins. <clears throat> so this means we need to work in unison with the other, other DT projects that are happening and uh, will happen also in the future. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, data is, is compatible with the European Open Science Cloud, so EOSC. Uh, this will help in ensuring the uh, openness of the results that we produce. And yeah, uh, adhering to harmonized data governance, governance principles as well as part of these wider EU initiatives. So making sure that uh, results are findable within the EU infrastructures. And in terms of outcomes, yes, we want to have data outputs from BioDT to Destination Earth. It could also be possible to have other ways of, of interaction. So, uh, data coming from other DTs to, to BioDT. So we need to design still the actual uh, specific use cases. Uh, interfaces and, and integration with EOSC. <clears throat> and also, yeah, synchronizing with, with other DT initiatives such as Ocean DT, so not just the um, uh, climate DTs, for example. So, okay, I come to the use cases next. So we have different um, different groups. So one is species response to environmental change. Another one is genetically de detected biodiversity. And then there's dynamics of species of policy concern, and then also influence of species interactions on uh, planetary well-being. So these are very general themes that we want to work with. And then we have more detailed use cases under these. And the data come from uh, these four research infrastructures, like I mentioned, so DESCO, ELTER, GPEF, and then uh, LifeWatch. So to go through these in a little bit more detail, um, in terms of this species response to environmental change, the problem is that very much the existing modeling approaches are insufficient. So we hope to develop some new ways to model biodiversity data as part of the project. Uh, hybrid modeling approaches, so we'll come to hybrid models quite soon. The idea is to combine biotic and abiotic data, so not just some um, species distribution data, for example. We will develop HPC compatible tools. The idea here is that we will end up with better predictions of shifts in species diversity distribution and abundance, and also some handle on how uncertain the predictions are. And the tools we use need to be able to run on high performance computing platforms. So about the hybrid models, so we have this um, starting scenario where we might have mechanistic and phenomenological models. And the idea is that um, uh, by developing hybrid models that combine elements of these two, we will have uh, in the end modeling approaches that work across a whole gradient of different use cases ranging from simple to very complex. So currently mechanistic models might work uh, quite well under simple conditions. Phenomenological or statistical models might work well with complex situations involving observa observational data, but we want to somehow combine elements of both into one. Uh, in terms of the second group, we have DNA-based methods. So these are increasingly, sorry, increasingly needed, for example, for food security. So in this uh, use case group, we want to focus on uh, crop wild relatives, especially cryptic habitats. So for example, soil, the idea is to, to incorporate DNA-based methods in the digital twins, for example, for species identification purposes. And also this will mean that we need to address some challenges, of course, that are specific to, specific to handling genetic data. The goal here, though, is to develop a better understanding of, of what happens in terms of 
biodiversity shifts in, in uh, arable lands and also in soil. There's an applied aspect, aspect to this as well. So DNA-based um, biodiversity modeling could be used, for example, by small and medium, medium scale enterprises. Um, in terms of the dynamics of species of policy concern, the problem is that often we don't have very reliable modeling approaches for uh, modeling distribution of these. And this is, for example, because of data scarcity. So we want to, and as part of this project, exploit large scale uh, spatial data and also high resolution temporal data to come up with some new predictions for, for invasive and endangered species. And the anticipated benefit is then that we would have better tools to, to aid ecosystem management in a way that is actually based on, on scientific ev evidence. Okay. Uh, the fourth group is about influence of species interactions on planetary well-being. So this is a very broad topic. We have multiple pressures coinciding with climate change. So here we want to focus on uh, pathogen distribution and pollinators especially. So predicting outbreaks for pathogen distribution uh, using pathogen distribution Pathogen, sorry, pathogen distribution data, uh, modeling pollinator distribution. And to make this possible, we will use maps of forage availability in agricultural landscapes. So also some mapping of, of availability, availability of, of forage. And the idea here is that we would have uh, better information on emerging diseases and where the diseases emerge and also improved knowledge of pollinated responses to, to uh, environmental change. So just to sum this up very briefly, uh, some take home messages. So the idea is that BioDT will give us the necessary infrastructure to, to drive some uh, long term trends in biodiversity research, help us maintain current uh, political com commitments to, to protecting biodiversity, safeguarding societal resilience. And Specifically, we want to use the BioDT project to observe spatial, spatial and temporal changes in biodiversity, develop also an, an improved mechanistic understanding of, of the changes that are happening, and to develop new modeling approaches to push the current boundaries of um, biodiversity modeling. So that's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much. And I will hand over to Alexi next. Thank you. I'll switch to my screen share. Okay, I hope you can see it. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexi Kallio, and I'm going to introduce you now to the technical platform that we have envisioned in, in this project. And to start with, start with the kind of the background. So, so in our our work package three, we are we are kind of responsible on on developing this technical platform for the digital twins. And what it says says in the plan is that we set up, develop, and operate the advanced technical platform required by the digital twins. So this is basically what we do. Then we provide world class HPC resources from the Lumi Euro HPC computing facility. So, this is the Lumi supercomputer, which was also mentioned in the title. I will briefly describe that as well. And then we ensure portability of digital twins across HPC sites and cloud environments. And finally, we maintain service catalog of search services for integration with European Open Science Cloud core services. So this is kind of roughly what's going to happen with the technical platform. But now first, to understand really that what is the technical challenge we are we are kind of tackling the main, main thing, then well, it, it really boils down to computational simulation because that's that's what digital twins do. They simulate the, the real phenomenon. And in, in this case, it's, it's biodiversity, so it's ecosystems. With, with agents interacting and, and kind of living their lives. And as you can imagine, a simulating an ecosystem is, is there's lots of details to go through 
So the amount of computing is, is immense. So very large amounts of computing time are required. And then, okay, you can then imagine that, oh, you could think that, okay, we have a lot of computing to be done. So let's just have a lot of computers. Let's draw computers at the problem. But it's not unfortunately so easy because, because with complex computing, you just cannot add capacity and, and, and kind of make it run faster. The challenge here is that, okay, we have agents that are living in the, in the simulation, but they are also interacting. And, and that's, this interaction makes it very more difficult to, to kind of benefit from, from more computing power and, and requires some special, special systems and special techniques. And, and that's really the kind of the bread and butter of, of, the, of the technical platform of what we are solving here. Then also as a background, what's quite, quite relevant and important is container technology, which is this way of packaging, packaging software and the runtime environment, kind of the operating parts of the operating system that you need to run your simulation into, into portable containers. And, and as, as you see in our kind of mission statement, we, we need to ensure portability of digital twins on across HPC sites but also on cloud environments and, and container technologies, kind of the key here, how we are going to achieve it. Here's a kind of very rough, rough sketch of different types of computing environments you can have. And, and this is kind of the, basically the world that we are, we are moving in, in our work. And, uh, and a familiar tool for everyone is a laptop the one that you are quite likely right now using to follow this follow this webinar and that's also in, in in simulation that's that's quite likely the most typical place to work you start with on, on your own laptop where it's easy you have everything at hand and, and kind of you can do a small test and development work on on the laptop but then eventually you will run out of capacity so the main main limiting factor is that on your laptop Something like two minutes is the longest runtime you can pretty much end, kind of endure. If your laptop is stuck for half an hour, then it's quite hard for your for your work. So then you need to move outside of your laptop, and 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 the kind of the next step would be cloud cloud or web services. So you have public cloud services like Amazon, Google, and so on, but then you also have the private services which are run in in your own local computing center or in your laboratory or in, in, in some other limited environment, not, op not open to the general public. And, and also these services, that there's a kind of immensely diverse world. So different levels, it can be on the low infrastructure level, it can be on the platform level, or it can be a complete red software that is offered on, on this fashion. So when you move from laptop to cloud, you get a lot more resources and also kind of you disconnect your working environment from the computing environment. So you can leave it to run there for hours or days or even weeks and it doesn't kind of interfere with your other stuff. But then we have one more step that can be taken and, and that's moving from cloud environment or, or kind of normal server environment to high performance computing environment. So then you go into high performance computing cluster or supercomputer, which is kind of the extreme of, of this scale. And what happens in this step is that, is that, uh, that in cloud environment, you are still working with kind of commodity, like everyday IT systems. So they are quite similar to your laptop in, in some sense. But then in high performance computing environment, you are working with specialized computing infrastructure. And the big difference is how, how this is connected. So in, in, in cloud, you have normal network connections, which are quite limited. Whereas in high performance computing environment, you have this specialized, specialized networking, which means that, that not only there's a lot of capacity, but it's very tightly connected so that you can actually use it to solve one single big problem. For example, a big simulation. I mentioned before that the challenge is is that agents are interacting and you have to be able to model this interaction 
which means that if you have a lot of computing units, they need to interact very effectively. And for this purpose, we have high performance computing environments, which are kind of tailored for this kind of stuff. So for the most complex and, and, and the largest simulations, you need to use the high performance computing environments. And this is now how, how Lumi and fits into this picture. So of course, kind of the core of Lumi sits on the extreme extreme end. So it's a supercomputer, high performance computing environment, but there's also kind of a long tail that goes all the way to the cloud service side. So Lumi is not only a single type of capacity, but, but has a bit more to it. I will show quickly it later. And in this project, we are using Lumi as a computing environment, which is very kind of important for this kind of work. But we are also now building this technical platform kind of wrapper so that so that in the end, what, what we create will be agnostic of the HPC environment. So it can be run on Lumi, but it can be run and will be run during the project also in other HPC sites, as well as in the cloud environment. So the idea is that that we make this available to largest possible audience and we will also kind of look into enabling at least parts of the framework also on laptops so that then we, you would have this kind of seamless seamless path from from your laptop all the way to the supercomputer and everything in between this is what lumi looks like so just to give you kind of the idea that what is the spectrum starting from your laptop and ending in this kind of industrial scale scale HPC system, the third largest in, in the world right now. And this is a, a technical slide with lots of numbers. The important point is that they are very large numbers. That, that's what you need to know. But then the main message is that there are different capacities connected together in Lumi. So it's, Lumi is, it's, it's not like a single instrument for something but it's actually a collection of instruments. So more, more like a laboratory for, for computational science. And in between there's a high speed interconnect. So everything is very tightly connected and, and kind of the scale of this interconnect is, is similar to basically the public internet. So you could quite likely run the whole public internet in it. And this was quick overview of what we are doing with regards to the technical platform and, and how kind of different computing capacities fit into this picture. And also what needs to be mentioned is that we are building collaboration with Destination Earth Initiative because there's work on digital twin runtime environments and we need to kind of synchronize that we are we are sharing what needs to be shared and kind of not, not reinventing the wheel on different projects. And also now I was talking about the computational infrastructure and platform, but there's also then the data layer. So because we are very much depending on, on, on data in this project, and, and we also are building the technical data layer to manage all of that. And current situation is that we are now starting to design the platform, doing the architecture, and right now collecting requirements from the use cases as mentioned by Jesse and then also talking with the computational models that what kind of modeling they are doing what kind of simulations need to be run and then how the technical platform supports that thank you thank you very much alexi so we're now closing this first part of the meeting so before we move on to the panel discussion um I would just like to invite you to a brief, quick, like polling exercise. So um, feel free to join us here on menti.com so that we can break the ice a little bit, uh, get to know each other and understand who the people that are interested in this project are. Um, and in the meantime, while you all log in to the, to the platform, and we start seeing the first cities appearing, I'd like to, to remind to you uh, to use the Q&A function uh, on Zoom for your questions. This way it's easier for the speakers to follow up uh, and type 
uh, the answers that you're looking for. Um, we see lots of cities, and not not only not only from Europe. I think they're <laughs> changing quite quickly on the screen. So we have more than a hundred people actually uh, connected today, and this is a really interesting uh, result for us. It means that there's lots of interest surrounding this new initiative. Um, so thanks for responding to this first question. Let's move on to a more interesting one which is which projects or initiatives related to biodiversity or digital twins you are or have been involved in. So this way we, we try to understand um, the, the landscape uh, that the people that are interested in this initiative come from and to understand a bit uh, more about the community. So we have some of the research infrastructures here. Uh, there's this call like watch uh, with Gaia data as well, change to twin. So we start to see uh, that lots of the communities, some of them already involved and some of them which will be involved in the future. So we see lots of research infrastructures. It's good to see that the community is responding to this call. DTO as well, Digital Twin of the Ocean. Uh, there's quite a few also come from, coming from Digital Twins. <clears throat> This is interesting, solar energy. And okay, I see that people are responding. So let's move on now to the third and last question of this really quick exercise. It's just useful for us to understand um, who the people are in this community. And now here, uh, it's, it's a more difficult one probably, which will also provide the basis for the coming discussion with uh, with the panelists, which challenges are you currently facing in using biodiversity data or creating digital twins? So basically, these are these are really important points that the consortium will have to address in the next three years. Um, and I believe that our colleague, our partner, Yeron, uh, will ask some of these questions to our panelists as well. Um, so while you keep on uh, piping your answers, I would like to introduce uh, Jeroen Berkhuisen uh, from TNO. He's the work package leader uh, here in the sorry work package representative in the uh, in this consortium, and he will moderate this session. So um, I will leave the floor to him uh, for a brief round of introduction of the panelists. And thank you very much for your responses. We will use these wisely in uh, in the upcoming months. And thanks a lot for joining again. Right. Thank you, Federico. I hope everyone can hear me just fine. Um, let me very briefly uh, get the speakers also on board. Um, I think we have Rita Bastos, um, postdoctoral researchers at CBO, Centro de Investigatio en Biodiversidade e Recursos Geneticos. I don't think I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I'm, I'm well. trying to make the effort. And um, we also have Ivan Lebras, Chief Technical Officer at PNDB, the National Infrastructure for Biodiversity Data. And uh, we have Sara Garaveri uh, from CSC, and she's Director at EOSC Association. And we have Thomas Geenen from ECMWF, uh, um, who is the Technology Partnership Leader at Destination Earth. Uh, all welcome. Uh, I see we're complete. Um, we've just seen. Um, the presentations uh, by uh, Jesse and, and Axeli, um, both on biodiversity and on the more technical aspects. I'd like to um, ask uh, maybe specifically Yvonne or Rita, uh, because of the more biological background. Um, how do you think a project like this could change um, the way we do research on biodiversity? Uh, I can answer. Um, so, well, um, I think that these kinds um, of projects um, somehow offer uh, unique opportunities to bring the field of environmental sciences um, at the forefront of this information era we are currently in. Um, not only because they will allow the development of platforms 
uh, capable of centralizing and storing a huge amount of data, uh, but also, and perhaps uh, more importantly, because they will make use of these advanced technologies to increase data processing, uh, such as these computer uh, simulation models uh, that ultimately will allow the scientific community to um, integrate more insights about the processes underlying environmental dynamics. And this is mostly through the study of interactions between different components um, of the system of the environmental uh, systems, uh, thereby uh, enabling um, more informed and innovative solutions um, regarding current and future environmental and social, uh, um, social uh, challenges in a yeah, general. I, maybe I can just add on the social challenge that it means for me, it's really important to see that the digital twin is maybe a goal or maybe not. But in, in fact, to, to reach this goal, uh, this, this is also a way to communicate, in fact, largely with the society, uh, maybe in citizen science project, but also in, in place where we have museum and things like that. So it's in the meantime, it's something we can use in the, for, to do science or to, to represent things or to model. But I think maybe more importantly, it's something who, who allow to share the knowledge and data information with uh, all people in society. I think uh, it's really important. So you're saying it's it's also a part of the, uh, not just doing science, but the collaboration with society and um, maybe also more interaction between the different you know groups who are doing this research. I think I think yes, it's it's really important because we we see that there is a lot of questions regarding the fact that we can model the model the biodiversity and put it in a virtual environment and and there is a lot of limitation technically and and uh, to to accessibility to data things like that. But at least this work can be used to help discussing with people and giving information to all the people about biodiversity and, and notably in the in the, the goal around biodiversity indicators creation. I think like that, I think it's a major uh, uh, pillar to, to go to go into, into this direction, I think. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious, maybe for for a wider, I think there you just listed the challenges that, that people face when using this kind of data or creating these kind of models. Um, we also had the question just now by Federico in the in the Mentimeter. Um, what do you think are the greatest obstacles to make this work? And sorry for not specifying a person, but uh, I'm just curious, both from maybe Ivan's perspective and also slightly bridging to Thomas, because um, Thomas has a different perspective, I think. Yeah, I can just see and, and show them before giving the floor to Thomas that uh, in our opinion in France, we, are, we, we created a, 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 a digital twin engine, but the, the approach is really more to be something quite uh, low cost, in fact, and just uh, using existing data and, and structured data. So if we need to, to create such a digital twin, we need uh, at least to have the structuration of the data and openness of the data. And uh, that's where we, we, we put the effort. And after that, the technological yeah. point come after that, but it's it's something different, for example, from destination Earth, who is something really more uh, business oriented and a, a big product, but uh, it's interesting to have both point of view, I think. So yeah, yeah, from, from destination Earth perspective, um, one of the main challenges we're currently looking at is making these digital twins interactive on a technical level. So the models, we have a lot of models, right? So for us over destination, Earth, we have weather models, we have coupling between ocean and land and atmosphere. So these things are in place, maybe not at the resolution that we want, um, but those are there. And the challenge for digital twins is to put on this additional layer of allowing users to interact with these models. And those technical components are currently constructing. And there's definitely a lot of challenges there uh, that we have to, to understand. Also understand how people want to interact with these models, right? So that's going to be a very interactive kind of co-design uh, journey with our users to understand what we have to build for them to make their life easy. I think the key here, what you're saying is making the life easy for users and right. um, both to do research or to engage with the data or with the 
re results from the models. Um, could we say that in five years, all researchers will have by default access to HPC supercomputers, or maybe even citizens can access these kinds of um, infrastructures? But I think for research, it's already quite easy. Right? If you want access to HPC resources now, you can just get it. I mean, the thing you have to do is you have to show that you have a model that actually can take advantage of these systems, right? That's basically the only thing they ask. But you can also ask for like projects to create that evidence, right? And that's like super lightweight. If you want access to an HPC system in two weeks from now, you can do that, both from Praise and from your HPC. So there's no um, obstacle on using HPC systems at the moment as well. And, and maybe another question is, is all scientists need an HPC connection? Because uh, the issue sure. we can see in French, for example, that uh, we can provide HPC uh, connection and maybe tools to facilitate it, but, and there is a uh, possibility for our researcher. But in fact, now in biodiversity, particularly, they don't need uh, it. Uh, yeah. Well, no, but maybe think... you want to interact with bigger models, right? So maybe indeed your specific model doesn't need HPC, but you want to maybe interact with a climate model that does need it. Right, so then if you need indeed what was mentioned also in an earlier uh, presentation, you need some kind of low easy cloud access to an, to an environment where you can run your maybe not so heavy model and interact with bigger models. I think that's a, a nice bridge also to, I think the, uh, the biological side and maybe Rita, you can you know, explain a little bit there, better there. Um, what I've heard so far is, um, there's a lot of, I would say, biological models already there, um, but at different scales usually. Um, so can you can you maybe say something about how this would enable researchers to you know create models on a maybe European scale and what would be needed to make something like that happen? Um, yeah, it really depends also on the data we we get because we can have site-specific data, uh, which in principle will be at more uh, fine uh, uh, scales. So those will be much more useful to, to model and to understand processes at the site levels, at the local scales. But then we have this problem of uh, standard observations uh, where uh, we can compare data across sites and in that sense, we, we, it would be uh, really useful to get um, these data at greater uh, environmental gradi gradients like the European uh, continent or uh, in that th those kind of data would be the, um, what we need to model a more global and a large scale phenomena. I think so, yeah. I just saw a, a question from the chat that might be nice to, to dive into um, and suggesting that there's all kinds of, uh, let's say, uh, models for certain species or certain areas or certain, I would say, cross uh, relationships between species. Um, there isn't a single model, you know, encompassing this whole spectrum. Um, would that be the solution or do you think something else might be a better approach there? I think that we are talking about the, these wall system approaches in which we can model, as I said before, the, mod, the different components of the, of the system and how they interact with each other. That would be like the, the perfect world, simulation world, because then we could understand and, and, and study the interactions between the different layers of the environment and that that would be that that is the the major goal i think we are trying to go um for yeah all right um sarah um rita just said um, there is um different data layers uh, different models and what i see is across europe these are usually done by different research groups um, how can these be tied together and how can we facilitate this from a European perspective? Yeah, so thanks for the question. So I think that, I mean, what Rita mentioned indeed are the challenges that also the, an initiative like the European Open Science Cloud is trying to address. 
And indeed, for those that are less familiar with, with EOSC, so the ambition of EOSC is really to create a, a web of fair data and services, meaning that uh, uh, we really want to increase availability of data, accessibility of data, discoverability of data, and that's where uh, the link with such initiatives that are working on a specific domain is really important. So at European level, uh, EOSC is, a, is agnostic in terms of domain, but meaning that it's really one of the aims to facilitate cross-disciplinary interaction, and that's one of the main uh, objectives. And that's where I really see initiatives like BioDT as uh, um, concrete pilots to really test our uh, enhanced data discoverability, data fairness. So this is really important as a contribution for um, at European level, but not just European. And I just want to mention that what Yvonne said before, that one of the other values of such initiative is really to bring all the right people around the same table. That's really important. And that's also what EOSC is trying to mobilize at European uh, level. And how do you think the research infrastructures or maybe even researchers themselves can, can use and connect to EOSC? Uh, so as you probably know, so EOSC is still under uh, development, but that's why it's really important that the research infrastructures uh, are following those developments because EOSC is trying to set up standards and protocols uh, specifically to in improve interoperability among research infrastructures. So this is also a very important point when defining the architecture of the digital twins to make sure that there is connection there. Uh, EOSC is also uh, aiming to provide very soon operational core services. And by core services, we mean services like persistent identifiers, uh, authorization authentication services, uh, discoverability services. So it's really important that uh, uh, um, initiatives, research infrastructures or initiatives like the digital twins uh, are integrated in that perspective. So to make sure that the accessibility of data is enabled and also the discoverability. And of course, uh, I believe another contribution from the research infrastructure is really to make sure that uh, the outputs, but also the services or the models that they are providing are available to other disciplines. And that's what EOSC is trying to, to, to achieve. Yeah, I also think that ties really well to uh, the Destination Earth um, program that we have from Europe. Um, in linking all these different la data layers in a standardized, harmonized way, I think that's also what you're saying, Sarah. Um, how could twins in general, so not just biodiversity, but in, in a general approach, um, make use of this? And I'm, I'm going to ask this to Thomas uh, in this case. Yes, yes, it's very important that digital twins can, um, can work together. I saw an, a question in the chat on there's not a digital twin that, that, that contains everything. So no, that's, I think, by design, right? You, you don't want to have that. That one is introduce a lot of complexity that you don't need. And it's going to make a very heavy model. So if you want to run something simple, then you have to run this, this huge model. Right? So you, you really don't want that. So it means that, uh, that these models have to have to interact with each other. So for instance, for, for weather and climate, at least if you're already doing that. So we have a coupled ocean model land atmosphere. So that, that's something we do. So we have a very tight coupling on the, uh, on the runtime, in the, the runtime, basically. But you can also think about interfaces on, on the data layer. Is that, you, that you expose data in a, in a standard way, or you can expose your services via an interface. So you can interact with these with these models. So you have interface on all different kinds of levels. I think standardization. We have to be careful there. We, we don't want to standardize too early. Right? We are at a very early stage, so we want to keep all the options open and don't make too many architectural decisions at the early stage, but postpone it till after we actually know what we want. I think that's in line with uh, the position from uh, EOSC. Uh, on, I think, have the whole federation where everyone uh, stays in charge of their own data um, and, and we uh, can offer the data in their own, you know, uh, most useful way uh, without imposing too much on others how it should be used. Uh, but at the same time, at some stage, uh, there will, will be a need for some harmonization there. Um, uh, I just saw a question from the chat uh, on, the, on the amount of data that is currently provided by monitoring infrastructures um, or 
data sets that are available in general. And I think this is uh, something that everyone is struggling with. Um, maybe Yvonne and Rita, you can comment on this a bit. Maybe I, I can f make a first uh, answer and, and combining this with the questions related to the modeling, uh, the existing of a modeling solution for any kind of uh, uh, modeling in, in ecology and things like that. I think both are really important. Uh, we need to have uh, real data and uh, real um, modeling and modeling uh, code and, and source code. When I say real, uh, I, I mean uh, uh, data and code as they are used in the research process, in fact, how they are used to, to for, for example, create uh, biodiversity indicators uh, we, we need to have the, the raw data and the, all the the workflows who are used from raw data to the creation of indicators so we can benefit from having something with really uh, research oriented not just trying to reinvent something who is maybe similar but not exactly coming from the research this is a really important point and and there is a lot of work to do around this both data mobilization raw data mobilization i think and also uh, source, source codes Ita, you also want to comment on this, or? Uh, well, uh, um, at a more uh, uh, particular uh, uh, scale, uh, I think that, um, and in terms of biodiversity data, it's really important to uh, accompany uh, biodiversity data also with abiotic data, uh, because um, we need to start relating biodiversity with environmental stressors and drivers of change, but also, and in the perspective of these predictive modeling, we need also to create scenarios um, which are reliable and which allowed us to uh, make accurate predictions of future uh, biodiversity and environmental trends. So I think that's something uh, really important to combine um, uh, from the beginning at the level of the raw data. Yeah, I also see that this is um, a change in the way of thinking on, on biodiversity um, in, in, in using, making this kind of data sets available and linking that to not just environment, but also human intervention and how we live in, in, in and, and that ties together also with the, um, different types of research infrastructures uh, where some are focused on biodiversity, some are based focused on demographics, some are based on oceans. Um, and how do they all tie together? How do they, and how can, can we then elaborate and make a more meaningful analysis based on the data that's available? And at the same stage, um, we're seeing, let's say a, a larger urgency in biodiversity from Europe or the UN or on a global level, um, we see urgency in terms of climate change, uh, what we as people can do. Um, I'm just also wondering, uh, we have Destination Earth, which is, you know, the goal is to create this digital twin of the Earth, which is a quite large scale. Um, Europe is starting out with uh, weather, climate, and, and, um, and uh, disaster, so to speak. Um, how could we ensure that in Europe, you know, other topics like biodiversity or uh, ocean or uh, agriculture uh, is, a, is going to become a part of that larger scale of things? Maybe that's for Sarah or Thomas uh, to comment on. Maybe I can go first. Well, I think that that to some to a certain extent that's already part of the of the European agenda, and that's really uh, the purpose of initiatives. Uh, like, I mean, I can talk from the EOSC perspective, but I mean, EOSC from the policy uh, level. So last year, the Council of Europe identified EOSC as the priority number one in the European research area. And there the purpose is really to make open science the new normal. And I think that that's one of the common factors for all the disciplines, because that's sort of the basis for then enabling what we were talking about uh, for the biodiversity area, but also for all the other areas uh, to address these uh, grand challenges. Um, and that's where also, I think uh, um, from the policy perspective, of course, there are some, um, policies related to the missions, specifically for certain thematic area. 
But again, so they don't work in silo, right? So we cannot be successful if there is no interactions among all of this. And even if you take the climate uh, change uh, adaptation mission, okay, so that can work only if other disciplines are working together with those really addressing just the environment part, because we know that the environment, it's not just sticking to one discipline. So I think that efforts are uh, already existing and they are uh, priorities in the national agendas as well. So that's my perspective on that. I don't know, Thomas, if you want to add anything from more the destiny perspective. Yeah, not, not that much. Uh, I think there will be a, a lot of calls in the, in the future on, on building digital twins on uh, for specific topics. Um, we try to be associated with those, uh, like we do with biodiversity the digital twin, to make sure that we uh, create a common landing platform and share common infrastructures and basically facilitate that, uh, that commonality. Yeah, and maybe I can add that from, from the EOSC perspective. So uh, we see EOSC as a sort of one of the channels, uh, for example, to strengthen the interaction between the research infrastructure, e-infrastructure, and other stakeholders. And that's really to improve the resilience of research infrastructures as well, which is something that we have seen with the COVID and now we are experiencing with climate change and these biodiversity challenges and, and so on. I just saw a comment from the chat, and I think um, um, uh, uh, that's what, what's already been said. Uh, it's not just uh, research infrastructures here. There is a wider network, and we, we need to facilitate this, this collaboration between those and make it easier for people to reuse this data, reuse this, these models, and reuse these twins, uh, because then everyone will have access, um, and that means hopefully a leap in in how we think about biodiversity um at that i'm gonna leave it i'm gonna hand it over back to jesse thanks everyone on the panel for this discussion and your contributions um i'm, I'm uh, really glad how uh, things went yes thanks Jaron. um we've had a very lively panel discussion and i'm very happy about how many people we've had join this um webinar. So I would first of all like to thank all of the um, people who were able to join us in this first uh, BioDT webinar. We have also some other webinars coming up. I think the next one is taking place in September. So I hope to see some of the same people at the, at the next webinar. But then, uh, of course, I would also like to thank Alexi for, for his presentation on the Lumi ecosystem and Trust IT for setting up this um, whole webinar for us. So we have very exciting times ahead. I think many of the questions also that came up in the, in the question session are very relevant, important to consider as the project evolves. So I, I hope that we have managed to answer so, most of these questions for you on, on time. Um, you are, of course, free to get in touch with, the, with us and the project also outside the, the webinar. So this is not the only, only uh, way to interact with us. Um, so with that, I can I can uh, close. So again, thank you very much for coming along to this webinar. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.